K-Wave 6 Radio and our host, Kirk Spencer, welcome you to our show, bringing positive messages to today's world. And now, here's Kirk. Hi, and welcome to K-Wave 6 Radio. Today, my guest, I'm not going to take a long time introducing her because most people know who she is already, especially if you're in business. Uh, and you couldn't miss her because she is so lively, so vivacious, the woman is driven, so on and so forth. I think that's enough of the introduction. Um, she is also the author and the business owner of Business in Blue Jeans. Welcome to the show, Susan Baranchini Mo. Thanks for having me, Kirk. It was my pleasure, especially after talking with you before we got on air. Uh, you are, as I said, lively, vivacious, fun-loving, and you're very driven, which we're going to get into it a little bit. But as we've been doing in this um, last month or so, talking about people, uh, we know what you've done already, because I introduced you as uh, Business in Blue Jeans. She's an author. She's an entrepreneur. She's a coach. You can get into all that stuff later on. But what is it about you that drives you what uh let's start even from childhood i mean just what was your childhood like and then the build up into where you are now yeah well um it's funny because unlike a lot of the you know a lot of people in my industry have kind of that you know i was living in the van down by the river you know hoping and i could feed my dog that year kind of story and i don't quite have the same kind of background, that same kind of style. Um, I, I grew up in, in a very nice family, um, you know, certainly in its own way dysfunctional, but um, I had a pretty good childhood, and um, my childhood was filled, filled with learning. And, you know, when we played games as a family, uh, it's a great question because people don't ask ask me about this often, and I think this is such an important key, especially if you're a parent and you want your kid to be a great success. Um, we, we played games, you know, board games, and we played card games, and our games were always, you know, educational games. So we had a card game called Authors, and you could still get this game, and, you know, we would, it was all the great authors, you know, Louisa May Alcott, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, all the, you know, Charles Dickens, and it was like a, kind of like a go fish game, and, um, you know, it was all about the great literature, and then we had one for musicians and composers, and, you know, we just had a lot of games that were around learning, so that my sister and I could really, you know, have our education, not just at school, but really infused into our everyday experience, and so certainly we had a lot of fun, too, there's a lot of playing, I was obsessed with stuffed animals and Barbie dolls. But really, quite early on, um, I discovered that there were things in life that I wanted, in particular bubblegum. And um, I really wanted to be able to buy, not just, you know, oh, this week I have to choose my bubblegum, but I wanted all the gum. So when I realized that it took money to do that, and I was pretty young, about six years old, uh, I had my first lemonade stand. It wasn't a lemonade stand. It was a Kool-Aid stand with grape Kool-Aid because everybody, like, lemonade was done. Everybody had done that, and I wanted something a little different. And so I started my very first entrepreneurial venture, um, you know, with that, that little Kool-Aid stand out on our street. And I was always looking for, you know, what could I do to earn a little bit of money. My parents were generous with us, but um, in fact, probably too generous because we were a little spoiled. But um, I think that um, that they that I always just wanted to have a little more control and a little more independence. And so I would make drawings and sell them to my parents and make up you know concoctions of shampoos and conditioners in my bathroom and try to sell those to my sister. And so so I've always been in business. I've always loved business, and I've also always loved learning. Uh, Susan, it sounds like you were born into a, well, it sounds like your birth was a competitive edge. Is Would that be an accurate observation? Absolutely, yes. I absolutely agree with what you're saying, yes. Um, and, and that's not always the easiest thing for someone in my line of work to say. Um, but, and, and primarily because, you know, 
the people in my industry, in the coaching industry in particular, especially business coaching, marketing coaching, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, we are in the business of making promises and building dreams. And when, you know, and, and I've had clients that, um, that didn't have the same advantages I had. And, and let's be honest, look, I went to a private school, I had, you know, lots of books around me, I had a lot of advantages. And, you know, a certain amount of being born into a culture of understanding how business gets done in the world and at a certain level. And, and I think that when you don't have that background, it, it, it certainly, you know, puts you at a slight disadvantage when you're starting out, but it's never something that you can't learn. You can learn all of those skills. And so even though I know a lot of the people, a lot of the purveyors of coaching um, are really interested in selling the dream and, and selling the hope that, you know, well, maybe I didn't have those advantages. Maybe I didn't grow up in that kind of family or my parents didn't surround me with books and educational toys. And, you know, I imagine to some people that sounds like a really boring childhood. But, but just for the record, it was not like that. It was really <laughs> fun. Um, but I know a lot, of, a lot of people might, you know, think, you know, I didn't have that. So how could I possibly have a successful business or how could I operate at that level or do those things? And the truth is that I have many, um, many friends and, 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 and acquaintances that I grew up with who had the exact same background I had and they have not done the things I've done. They're still kind of trying to figure it out. And, and so it's not about having the advantages, although I do think that my background is an advantage, it, it's, but it's not about having those advantages. You, you might have other advantages, but I'm not who I am today simply because of the advantages I experienced in life. I'm, I'm who I am today because what I do is really important to me. Um, the work I do matters to me enormously. And, and really, in terms of, of the book, I wrote the book you know, it, it's a great it's a great marketing tool for me. It's nice, but I wrote the book because honestly, there were a lot of people who came to me who said, "I really want to hire you, or I want to take one of your classes, or I want to, you know, whatever," but I can't afford to. And it's that kind of conversation that always breaks my heart. Everyone should be able to afford that. Everyone should be able to afford the kind of help they need if they want to be entrepreneurial and have a successful career. And it drove me crazy how many conversations I had like that. And so I wrote the book largely because I had too many of those conversations and my heart got broken too many times hearing people with good ideas and big dreams and, and knowing that I couldn't help them because, you know, in business, I can't, and I can't do it for free. Occasionally we'll take on a pro bono client when I think that I really can't have an impact, but it's not something I can do on a regular basis but from a financial perspective. So I wrote the book so that, you know, people who, who didn't have the money to hire me initially could at least have a lot of the same exercises and homework assignments and experience that, you know, wouldn't be quite as rich as, you know, as actually having doing the work together, but would certainly give them the information they need. Now, what they choose to do with it, that's up to them. But I do think that, yeah, I have advantages because of my background, but I also think there are an awful lot of people who don't have those advantages, who've proven again and again, you don't have to have the background. Hat. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Matter of fact, I'm listening to you and I'm smiling from ear to ear like the little chessy cat as we always grew up with knowing. <laughs> Because I'm listening to you, and I had written down just about that time that you went into It Breaks Your Heart because people can't afford what you're talking about. But what I had just written down was important to you, the business. Because it's something, it's not for you just to earn money. And, I, and a friend of mine who's also a business coach, and he and I are friends, he... Um, I had him on my show last year when I was running a show by a different name, and uh, he invited me to one of his webinars, and what he had written down was, uh, no, he was, he was talking about, well, he was recruiting people in for his classes, that's what it was, and uh, he was talking about stuff, and he left his text uh, message open on the webinar, and he was welcoming people to do it, so I wrote in there just a message to him. And that was the way it intended to be. Uh, I was telling him, I said, if people are in 
or is starting a business on their own just for the money. I said, they're setting themselves up for failure. If you don't love what you're doing, if it's not something that's coming from within, you're not going to win at what you're doing. And you just got through saying it without prompting it. It's just very important to you. In other words, to put it in my own words, it's what drives you on a daily basis to do what you do. Would that be accurate? I really believe in sort of a, a, a dual driver system. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I, I, I believe in, you know, you do have to love what you do, otherwise you're going to dread every single day and be miserable. And mm-hmm. that's what, you know, most of us start businesses, so we're not miserable. You know, a lot of the, the people that I work with are are intentional about wanting to enjoy their day. That doesn't mean you enjoy everything. I still have to do accounting for God's sake. That's horrible. Yes, so, <laughs> right. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, you're right. I, I think, you know, we do want to enjoy our lives and, and have meaning behind our lives. Um, I don't get all my meaning from my business. Obviously, you know, I don't think that anyone should. No. Um, you know, I do a lot of community service, a lot of work in my local area, um, to, to give back and, and certainly a portion of, of the, the income from business in blue jeans is donated to worthy causes that I believe in. But the other piece is that, um, that I derive enormous meaning from my personal life and my family and, um, my business makes it possible for me to have a really enjoyable, relaxed life. So I've worked this business and, and built this brand specifically, you know, at least in, in, in I would say at least 50% of it, if not a little more, uh, to, to create a certain kind of lifestyle for my family. And, and so that we can travel, you know, my husband is from another country and has children in another country. So there are two countries outside of the United States that we a substantial amount of time in and so you know to make that possible takes money so you know we I work a lot um, to to make a difference to help people to become more independent and kind of go after that American dream idea because I believe it's still alive and well but I also to some extent do this so that you know like my my dad always used to you know my dad was a, is a doctor and and he's now retired and he he always used to say you know I like medicine but I really like the money because it makes the rest of my life possible. And he is the person who taught me that life should be rich and full of abundant experiences. And my dad has tried over 130 hobbies in his lifetime. I'm not quite that sophisticated. I've only tried a little over 100. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I think, you know, it's, it's because life is so rich, you know, and there's so much to experience. And so the way I've structured my business, the way it's set up, the way in which I work with my clients – and the income it affords me means that I can have the life I want. And so I can really, truly live. And I think that's kind of the, the dual driver system that I, I think about. Does You know what I'm saying? Yes, I do. I started laughing because uh, you reminded me of um, I, I got into hitchhiking around the country again for my second <laughs> time only about, oh, 11 years ago. And don't ask me how that got me into Mexico, but nonetheless, <laughs> I wasn't running from anybody, <laughs> except for President. I wasn't going to ask. <laughs> no, except for President Bush, who was in office at that time. <laughs> he was beginning to really frighten me. <laughs> but um, anyhow, that and the fact that I wanted to get into warmer weather. So yeah, that's the two basic reasons why I came down here. Uh, anyhow. I remember uh, I was working at a place, uh, I was just doing day labor, and uh, I liked the place. It was just very nicely run, people were very nice, etc., etc. So I gave the oh, somebody in the organization my resume. Two days later, the company president came out to me and he says, I'm reading your resume, and he had it in hand, and he goes... What haven't you done in your lifetime? I said, I've never been a politician, so don't worry about it. I'm not going there. <laughs> so we just laughed and talked, and I got hired. So, <laughs> But we're going to take a break real quick, and we're going to come back with Susan Barancini Mo of Business in Blue Jeans. So please stay tuned. Hi, I'm Doug Harold. You're listening to the K-Wave 6 Radio with my friend Kurt Spencer 
I'm with Time and Eternity, timeandeternity.net. Uh, I'm really glad you're listening to the K-Wave 6 Radio. Hi, this is Pat Kammer, author of Lost Voice Changes You, book one. And I now have book two, which is called Hello Awesome, Message from Spirit in Pat's Patters. Buy your book from Amazon.com. Hi and welcome back. Uh, again, my guest today is Susan Barancini Mo of Business in Blue Jeans. When we left off before the break, we were talking about quite a lot of stuff already. Um, but we were talking about how her her father had over 130 hobbies, and she hasn't gotten quite there yet, but she's still young. So, <laughs> <laughs> so she has the ability to get there, and. As some of my other guests have even said, it's just a point in life. It's not saying that you have to find on one thing to focus on and do that only. That might be, as Susan is doing and many others, uh, this is your focus for your life and your income, but that doesn't mean that you can't venture out and do other things. As Susan said just a little while ago, she's active in her community. She does. Uh, she gives to charities that she likes and supports. And there's always something going on in life. So, in other words, learn to enjoy life, enjoy your business, and then I'm going to shut up because I'm starting to give away to the end of the program. Anyway, Susan, go right ahead. <laughs> No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, though. I mean, you know, I I, um, I remember when my stepchildren came to visit for the first time, uh, and and they spent summers with us. They 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 live in England with their mom, mm-hmm. and um, although my my seventeen year old is now my step uh, stepson is coming here to stay for a while, so we're going to actually have a kid in the house for a couple of months. So mm-hmm. that should be really fun. But I remember when they first came here and how how sort of taken aback I was because I I it, they they were saying things like I'm bored and I was like what do you mean you're bored look around you there's so much to do how can I be bored mm-hmm. I forgot how you know how kids needed to be entertained a little bit and so you know that was really a, an eye opener and and I think that um, it was an eye opener for me in terms of my own philosophy of life mm-hmm. because I don't remember really ever being bored. I'm not, I don't get bored. Mm-hmm. Um, if I am uh, in a, in a, um, if an airport waiting for a flight, you know, I, I could be reading on my iPhone or, or my, um, my iPad, or I could be reading an actual book, which I prefer, mm-hmm. or, you know, look at the many people around that you could be looking at. People are so interesting to look at mm-hmm. and you know, so much to experience. And just going outside and getting a little sun or trying a new hobby or, you know, tonight I start knitting a new afghan. And, you know, it's it's silly. You know, there are so many little things. But I think I think a lot of people are scared to try things because they're afraid they might fail. You know, every time I try a new hobby, yeah, I totally might fail. But it's going to be so much fun. <laughs> so, you know, I really enjoy the process and and here's the other thing i read this great book recently called go wild by dr john rady and i interviewed him on my podcast because i found the book so unbelievably compelling and he talks about how these these enriching experiences in life actually make us smarter and it makes our brain work better so the more variety you bring into your life and the more things you try the smarter you'll be. And I, I heard that. I was like, oh, this is awesome. I want to be smarter. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, well, see, I was, I, I say this kind of tongue in cheek. I was kind of sometimes that nerdy kid because I would sit down when I was 18 years old, out of high school, didn't have to do this. And I sat down with an encyclopedic dictionary and learned all the prefixes and suffixes, what they meant, and went on and learned some other stuff straight out of the dictionary. (laughs) The only problem that came from that was when I started talking to other people after I learned how to use words better, was, it sounds really nice, but I don't understand a word you're saying. (laughs) So... 
that had his drawbacks. <laughs> I'm mad. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it comes in handy when you go writing because if people are saying, ah, you need to dummy it down. I said, that's not the idea of writing. It's not to dummy people down. It's to actually to lift them up. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just stick with that. But anyhow, um, one thing I want to say extra to what you're talking about uh, with your stepkids, you know, coming in and saying, I'm bored. Uh, the the things that I used to do was, um, well, let's see. By the time I was in my mid-twenties, I had already hitchhiked around the country my first time. I had lived out of country a couple of times already, or two, two or three times. And I'd been to college some, and I was going out one night to a party. It was a house party during the week. So it wasn't <laughs> one of those weekend things. <laughs> and my mother... Uh, she was, uh, she comes from a very mm, rigid background, put it that way. My father's a little bit more liberal, or in that case, a lot more liberal. Uh, I was going out, and this party was starting around nine, ten o'clock at night. Yeah, I wasn't going to stay out for too long. And, uh, my mother's having a fit, and I'm just kind of like, yeah, okay, 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 okay. And I'm on my way out the door, and she's calling my dad, John, come over here and tell him he shouldn't be going out to a party at 10 o'clock at night, and da 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 da. And my mother, my father looked at her, and he looked at me, and he looked back at her, and he says, he calls her by her first name, she goes, he has lived more of his life at his age now than you have in your whole life. I forget it was 50 some years or something like that. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and she just kind of looked at him and went, oh. <laughs> and I went to the party. It's no problem. There was nobody doing anything that would cause a problem with the police or the neighbors or anything along that line. It was a wonderful, nice party. Just people in their early to mid 20s. And it was just music and food. Uh, there was a little bit of drink, but nobody was doing anything in excess, so on and so forth. So it was uh, just that which my father knew and supported was just the fact that I will go out and I will take care of myself because I've already lived out of country, I've hitchhiked around the country, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I well, deviated too much, but yeah. <laughs> no, but but the great thing is that um, you know, as as my stepchildren have grown and evolved, they have learned how not to be bored, and and I don't I don't remember hearing that since that summer. I think it was that summer where they learned how not to get bored uh -huh. and how to experience the world around them. You know, there's just and and to see the richness, and so. Yeah, I think it's funny, you know, we, we learn so much just from watching kids and experiencing them, and they learn from us, too, so oh, it's yeah. a good balance. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. So, tell us, what was your, uh, you got into, you kind of jump, jumped right into where you are and what drives you, so... Tell us a little bit more about, say, maybe your high school and your college years. Oh, um... What was that like for you? Well, you know, I thought that I was going to be, my, it, well, let me say this, my, my, from a, from a social perspective, it, I think is probably as one would expect given who I am today. Um, and given, you know, what my life is like. So, so in my high school years, I was very much a dabbler, not in one group or another, but sort of a little bit in all groups. Um, it was very important to me to have an enormous amount of variety and, and in my friends and to, have a um, a diverse collection of of people that I surrounded myself with to kind of capture both you know, you know there's that idea that you know you are the average of the, the ten people you spend the most time with and I always think that's kind of a um, odd way to look at friendship and and I try not to look at friendship that way I, I like to have friends that pull me up friends that are kind of where I am. And friends that are, are people I can encourage. And so I kind of did that in high school as well. And, and I think that high school for me was also um, very much an exploration of, you know, interests and ideas. Um, I didn't I, – I really thought as a high school student I was convinced, um, and, and I think everyone was convinced, that I was destined to be a violinist. And I was going to be a violinist, most likely in an orchestra 
I, I don't know, I don't have perspective on really how good I was other than I had a scholarship to college. But I think that, um, I, I mean, maybe I would have been a soloist, but more likely a, a violinist in an orchestra somewhere teaching violin lessons and things like that. And, mm -hmm. and I had been playing since I was six and, and, um, back then that was a big deal because <laughs> they didn't start any earlier, but, um, but I thought that's who I was going to be. And, um, when I went to college, um, I went to a very small um, liberal arts college here in Indiana, and it was a very conservative college. It was largely Greek. And um, so because I had no interest in pledging a sorority, um, that, that school was 98% Greek. So wow. <laughs> it was, I was that little tiny 2% that said, no, sorority life is not for me. Uh -huh. And so that you know, plus, um, you know, I, I got to college and having been the big fish in a small pond, you know, and then I got to college and they said, we thought, we think you might be a great viol a violist, which if you've played violin for, you know, your whole life, and then someone says, we think you might like viola, viola is a great instrument, but that really, from a cultural perspective, is a whole other ball of wax, and it's also a whole other clef on the music, um, on the music staff, and so it's a whole other thing, and, and so I um, kind of along with that happening as well as some family stuff happening that's about the time my parents um decided they were going to get a divorce and so my whole sort of like safe stable world uh kind of in a very uh first world problems kind of way uh kind of came crashing down around me and i really had a lot of um uncertainty around who I was and who I was going to become. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I felt a lot like the, the stability of the ground beneath me had, had wavered substantially. And so um, I, that kind of spurred several years of searching. And I spent, uh, let's see, I like to say that college took me four schools in six years. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so... Um, I ended up graduating six years after I started and uh, with my degree in, in what was technically called law and society, but was really just a sociology degree with an emphasis in criminology. <laughs> and I know it's a very weird thing to, to, to say now because it's so different from where I am now, but you'd be surprised. But, um, <laughs> um, but uh, my, and in fact, my thesis, my senior thesis project was um, conducting qualitative research in Indiana state prisons. So that was fascinating. Okay, we're back. Sorry, we had a little problem with Skype. Uh, like I said before, if you understand Skype, sometimes it will drop you. So anyway, she left off with uh, her thesis at Indiana State University and working in the prisons. It, it was actually at, at Purdue University. Oh, my, sorry. my four schools are actually DePaul University, uh, Butler University, IUPUI, and Purdue. And I finished at Purdue. And so my, my senior thesis was conducting research in the Indiana prisons, and, and it was fascinating. But, um, <laughs> but you, know, you know, what do you do with a degree like that? So I, I ended up going to graduate school because I didn't know what else to do. And... When I got to graduate school, I learned that um, I, I enjoyed criminology, but I loved social psychology more. So that's really what, what I began to pursue and, and what I pursued with a vengeance. And um, my, my master's thesis focused on digital communication because it was really a time where the Internet was sort of... <laughs> this is how old I am. It was sort of new. Yeah. And so people were just starting to use emoticons as little, you know, the colon for the, for, with the parentheses as a smiley yeah. face. Mm -hmm. So my, my research was really focused on the impact of that kind of communication. Um, and I was definitely ahead of my time back then. But the, way, the reason I was ahead of my time is that I was paying my way through graduate school by teaching web design and development in uh -huh. these really high-level um, tech support department in the campus and so I taught faculty staff and students how to create websites and do graphics and all of these things so that was really that plus teaching social psychology classes was really how I developed my understanding of good pedagogy which I use today and and you know teaching is a big part of what I do so that was a really useful lesson but um 
But as happens, I, I was recruited out of the university. The university asked me to stay on once I finished my degree, and I did, and continued doing the same work. And then I was recruited to to move to Des Moines, and where there are a there's a there's a surprising number of magazine publishers in Des Moines, and so. Um, they recruited me to help them take their printed content and turn it into digital content online. So I moved there and I was doing that for a while and consulting and, and having a wonderful time when I got carpal tunnel and had to figure out what I was going to do from there. And, and the doctor pretty much said, you're at a point where if you stop what you're doing now and change careers, you'll be just fine. But if you keep doing this, you will have surgery probably many times over in the course of your lifetime and career. Well, I'm not a fan of surgery, so <laughs> I changed careers and embarked upon the path I've been on for the last uh, 15, 16 years. Wonderful. We're going to take a break, and we're going to come right back, and we're going to kind of review a little bit, and then I'm just going to just give uh, Susan the, the reins and just go, go for it, girl. <laughs> so anyway, stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Megan Serleski, author of Who Am I? How My Daughter Taught Me to Let Go and Live Again. And I am on K-Wave 6 Radio. Are you ready to put an end to thinking about how you wish it were and take action? Take this step to find out more by going to coachingbyria.com. And you can receive your free consultation session with Coach Rhea. Coach Rhea is a certified professional life coach with a passion to help make the difference in the world. Hi, this is Amy Young of JSJ Phone. We are providers of junior iPhone, iPad, iPod, also Samsung, Sony, Nokia parts and accessories at very good quality and low prices. We sell to individuals and the companies have 3 to 5 days delivery time by DHL or UPS. We do delivery in 24 hours after payment confirmed. For more information, see our website www.jsjphone.com www jsjphone.com Contact me Amy Young mailbox emy at jsjphone.com or by phone 0086-1341869-6395 by Skype emy.yang 2012. Aloha from Maui, Hawaii. This is Carrie Gray of My Green Insurance at MyGreenInsurance.com. Thank you for joining us. We are the first co op for alternative medicine health coverage. You're listening to us on kwave6radio.tk. Aloha! Hi and welcome back. Uh, before we went on break, uh, Susan has told us about how she went from violinist to, I forget all the steps you had in between, graphic designers, website, website designer, uh, teacher, um etc etc so keep going i'm learning more about you as we talk or listen well um i went to uh colorado and spent several weeks in the mountains of park and uh, studied neurolinguistic programming which is at the heart of much of the, um, the coaching work that i do and um is also very very much present in my book and uh, when I came back, I did a lot of training with Nightingale Conant and quite a bit of other training programs to really equip myself to be a good coach. And um, so I, I learned a lot about, you know, you, they, you know, they make you learn a lot about yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But um, I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about other human beings and, um, you know, embarked upon my coaching adventure. I did not know that uh, I would attract so many entrepreneurs, but because I do things the way I do them, which is I jump in with both feet, uh, I had a website and I had a logo and I had, you know, brochures and all the things I need. Those things seem like they, you know, most people have them, but a surprising number of people back then did not know how to do those things, mm-hmm. and it wasn't so easy to get them done. Um, so a lot of people would ask me for very things that fell very much under the purview of consulting rather than coaching, and so I very quickly realized I needed to learn a lot more and began to study with. Um, with great determination, marketing, branding, networking, sales, all the different aspects of running a business, in part because that was useful stuff for me to know, but also because it turned out my clients wanted to know it too. And um, so over the, over the years, I've just, you know, I read the books, I study as much as I can, I take courses from time to time, but the best place that I learn is, is always books and articles and, you know, really going deep with a subject and then if I still have questions, I go straight to the horse's mouth. I go to the authors. Yeah. And so I've had a large number of wonderful mentors over the years who have graciously allowed me to ask them deeper questions about their work and, and to get much deeper into the subject matter and kind of take it to a different level than one would ordinarily experience in their in their, in their written work. And so... Um, that has been an enormous blessing. I've also had a great number of, of fantastic coaches that I've worked with that um, have really helped me to work on my own limiting beliefs, my own ideas about who I am and who I'm meant to be and, and what my, my purpose is. Uh, I think or like my husband. My husband's a drummer and has always and he was going to be a drummer uh, i as as you've heard have have not always known what I was meant to do. Um, and only, you know, in the last, I would say, five to ten years have realized I'm here for, for really three things. One is teaching, one is writing, and another is not not exactly business or entrepreneurship per se, but the life you can have, the richness you can have, the experience you can have while you're experiencing this amazing gift of life. And, and so um, I guess my way to get at that is is business in part because I for me at least I can't imagine getting in a car driving an hour to a job sitting under a fluorescent light all day in front of a computer screen doing the same work every single day and then driving home and I only have a few I mean I remember those years and I didn't like it I always felt like I had no time no time to really enjoy the world and experience all that life has to offer. And I can safely and completely say that now, you know, with my business where it is and where it's been for the last five, five years or so, I would say, uh, because the economy did hit pretty hard. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. The recession hit pretty hard, Um, but it hit all small business owners. And so, um, you know, we had to find ways around that and, and avenues for managing that. But, but I would say in the last five years or so, uh, I have felt enormously stable and comfortable and, and have really thoroughly enjoyed the world around me. And, and that has been, you know, just a really great thing. So I think that's really my, my business. You know, you have the space and the time. Even though you're working a lot, you can manage that time ever since you best. And so, you know, I work hard, but I work smart. And so... Um, you know, that might not be the most grammatically correct sentence, but that's how I, that's how I am. And so when I'm working, I'm working all in. And, and when I, I'm playing, I'm playing all in. So that's that's my story, I guess. I mean, that doesn't bring you totally current, but that's kind of the deal. <laughs> I don't know. What else do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you have. I have two questions. Part of one, the second one, actually, is what you started into, and we're going to get to that in just a moment, but you were talking about um, working that 9-to-5 job, working in a cubicle, per se, under fluorescent lights, and you hated it, and elaborate on that one a little bit, because I do have a question I want to go with that one. Well, I actually loved the work, and and I love the work of, I love technical work, I Mm -hmm. do. 
Um, I love coming. I love seeing something that I've created come to life. I love that, you know, it's something that I can do that a lot of people can't do. And I can do it quickly and for fun. So that's how I do it now. But um, I don't get involved technically in client projects anymore. But I'll do fun things for, you know, a friend's band or something. Yeah. But um, that's just to keep the, the skills sharp. But I, I liked the work. I just didn't like being under someone else's thumb. Mm-hmm. And having someone else control when I could go to lunch, when I could leave, if I was expected to stay longer. And the thing I really didn't like was that one of the companies I worked for was, was privately owned. And um, and it was an entrepreneurial kind of company, meaning that they were very – they put a lot of importance on coming up with ideas and, and you know, owning the ideas. Mm-hmm. But the thing is that, that there were no real rewards to those ideas. They didn't, a lot of companies now have this uh, entrepreneurial concept where if you come up with an idea as an employee, the company certainly, you know, will, will benefit from that idea, but so will you in certain mm-hmm. ways. And, and I support that completely, especially for people who are getting their feet wet and, you know, because they're not quite ready for the risk or not quite ready for, you know, all of the, 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 work that comes into it and not quite ready for, like, maybe they don't have enough experience to do it. So um, I think it's a great concept. But back then, you know, this company didn't have any of that. It was just come up with awesome ideas and we're going to benefit from them. And I was, I guess I really didn't love the idea that I would come up with some awesome idea that would ultimately just buy my boss another boat. Like, I, I just thought that is horrible. Mm-hmm. I want to be the one who gets the boat if I come up with a great idea. And so that's um, that was really the part I hated the most and lack of control of my own life and my own time. So th- that was what, what made me the most crazy. So I was almost – I see getting carpal tunnel as a great blessing because I would still be in a cubicle today had I not gotten that – had it, that not happened. There you go. And then we wouldn't be hearing you talking like you are now, <laughs> which I'm enjoying. <laughs> <laughs> and which – Probably kept you in my mind uh, from seeing your website some time ago. I don't know how long ago, a couple of years ago at least. So anyhow, uh, let's just move on with this thought here because uh, you're talking about a lot of different things that I want to pull up. There are some people that actually do need the structure of a corporate boss or a supervisor or a manager. I have a cousin that was kind of that way. He couldn't work at home after working in the court system for all those years, and so he went back to work. So, um, But there's others like yourself and me who, is for different reasons, you know, you're saying, I don't want to watch my boss get his boat and I don't get anything, and I'm the one who's actually doing the brainy stuff, and he's just supervising. Not to say that he did, but nonetheless, um, you're coming up with something and you're watching somebody else benefit from your work much more, and you're not getting any compensation for it. But taking that and... Uh, Let's take it from this. You're a coach, you're a business coach. You're probably in some form or fashion even a life coach to a certain degree. Uh, I don't know if you are or not, so pardon me if you are a life coach. But (laughs) anyway, what we're getting to here is that... um, (laughs) uh, She's laughing already. (laughs) But no, the... um, what I'm really actually getting to here is the the how people basically in well at least in my experience is just that I don't want to work with that structure because oh, here we go again partners folks another Skype anyway um Susan this was time they dropped me out so um. Susan was telling me that I left off talking about, I'm not sure she was a life coach, so she is. Please pardon me for skipping over that one. But uh, what I'm really getting to is uh, people such as Susan and myself, we have our own little reasons for not getting into or not wanting to stay in, uh, stay in the corporate structure. Because, at least for me, it was just a point of, I want to work for me and I really have a desire to do something more than what I've just been told to do or what I have to do every day. In other words, I want to do something that is fulfilling for me, and that's not just earning money, 
I say earning because, as a friend of mine used to say, to make money is counterfeiting, and that's against the law. So, anyway, uh, I want to do something that earns my living, but I want to be able to put me into it every day, that which drives me. And what I did even last week, I worked for one day, I worked for 17 and an hour, 17 and a half hours straight. But that was only because I just realized I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning and I got off, finished doing this around 9.30, 10.30 at night. <laughs> it was like, that was one fulfilling day, but uh, let's just try to keep it to at least 12 hours a day. <laughs> hey, when you're in the zone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's the part that I'm kind of talking about with people that have that drive. Do you have that drive that you can go... I'm doing it because that's what I want to do, and I want to, as even Susan said earlier, I want to see my thoughts become a reality. In other words, they take life. So that's why I do what I do. You know, and, and I think that makes sense. There, and you're right. There are people that need that structure and that also want the responsibility. And, and it is an enormous responsibility when you have staff and employees that are dependent on you and you do your job so they can have more to do uh, to feed their families. And, and I am always acutely aware of that with my own team uh, as I, you know, I go out and, and build my business and as I bring in more client work for them to do and, and projects that they can do, I'm always thinking, boy, I, I really want to keep this going, not just for my family, but for the families and the people that work with me. It's important to them, this income, and, and I don't want to mess with that, and, and I don't want to, but it's not, you know, most of my my team are contractors, so they are free to take other work as needed, so for the most part, I don't really, you know, I don't, I don't tie them up, and, and I also don't have as much to worry about as if they were employees, however... Um, it does make me nervous from time to time when I think about, you know, if I do take on employees, you know, I have a big, big responsibility. So I think there are a lot of people who don't, maybe don't want that responsibility. And I don't, I don't blame them for not. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of thing that can keep you up at night. People don't talk a lot about that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I understand exactly. I have a little production company on the side and I have people work with me and for me because like you say, they're independent contractors. So, not their boss. I just wrecked them. This is what I need done. So, yeah. Anyway, before we go on our last break here, actually, let's take our last break and we'll let Susan run with this one. So, stay tuned and we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. This is Jason Pockrant of Live to Give over at jasonpockrant.com and you are listening to K Wave 6 Radio. Do you get writer's block or tongue-tied when you try to write or talk? Need a wordsmith for a script, article, or research paper? Let K-Wave 6 Productions help you with all of your audio, visual, editing, and language translation needs for your business or hobby. Does the thought of creating a website give you chills? We also have webmasters to help you with all your website needs. Remember, K-Wave 6 Productions www.kwave6productions.tk or email us at info.kwave6productions.tk Hello and welcome back. Uh, this is our last segment of our show today with Susan baroncini Mo of Business in Blue Jeans. Before our break, I wanted to ask her a question, which I'm going to ask right now. And then I want to let her run with her advices and what she does with that. Um, Susan, uh, something I read a long time ago, compared to my age right now, that was a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, people such as, was it J.C. Penney? Pretty much everybody knows J.C. Penney from the stores. He got his biggest boost in life where he went from a small store in some place in Wyoming and made it into a chain back when he was around 55 years old. Uh, there's been other people that you've, that 
the majority of people think, well, he got started when he was young or he came from a lot of money. And people are finding out if they actually look into some of the people that they really admire, they didn't get their start at such an early age. A lot of them were uh, parents of adult children, if not grandparents, etc., etc. People that just actually took their time or they found that niche that they really enjoyed later in life. So in other words, it's not too late to get started. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you take it from there? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of that, and, and I absolutely think it's never too late. Um, in fact, uh, Colonel Sanders started Kentucky Fried Chicken with his first Social Security check. Uh, Mary Kay Ash didn't start the Mary Kay empire until she was I, I, maybe in her 50s. Um, you know, and, and I myself didn't really find what I'm doing until I was in my 30s. So, you know, I really think that, um, you know, a lot of have that idea that you know it's too late for me or um i can't i can't do this thing because i'm too old um and it always strikes me as as well it's i think in part it's because of the way that my dad is and my dad is um right now he's 81 and he got his he got a, a big tattoo when he was 75 and he just this whole shoulder thing with a tiger and i asked him why did you get that tiger on your shoulder why did you choose that and I had to go with him for the sittings because I was terrified that he was going to go into a diabetic coma. And so um, when when I I went with him and, and I was sitting with him, you know, getting this tattoo, I said, why why the tiger? And he said, because that's how I see myself. He said, you know, that when people look at me, they see a 75-year-old man and I'm old and I'm wrinkled. And the thing is, though, I'm still in the fight. And, and I am still very much this tiger, and this is how I, I see myself. And then, and then, of course, he went, Arr! So, you know, I, I think that um, you always want to think of yourself as in the fight. You know, you're, you're not, unless you're dead, you are still in the game. Yes, So indeed. it's never too late, and you're, you can always be that tiger. You can always be in the fight. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I have my own way of putting it, not for that kind of, well, actually, two little things. Um, when you stop learning is when you're dead because yeah. even if you don't read a book or read something you're still learning something somewhere uh, the other side of that is is that I used to say this when I was in my I would say early 20s if not late teens and people said why don't you settle down because everybody just had this thing of at least when I was growing up find what you want to do and settle down into it and get your retirement watch when you get old and I went, that sounds really boring. <laughs> so I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But people used to ask me, why do you do all this? Why do you travel? Why do you do that? And, uh, you know, hitchhike and all the rest of that stuff that I was doing back then. I said, when I get to be too old to do any of that, whatever age that is, I want to be able to sit back and remember all the things that I've done, not sit back and go, I wish I had done that, or I wish I had done this, and I had the yeah. chance. You got the chance. Take it. Because when you get yeah, older, all you're going to have is remember, uh, memories. So true. And, you know, I heard somebody say something like, always regret the things, you know, you, you always regret the things you didn't do, but mm -hmm. you hardly ever regret the things you did do. Yeah, exactly. Even the mistakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, speaking of mistakes, how do you, because I know you probably have to cross this, at least in your coaching and whatnot, uh, people are afraid to make mistakes. They're afraid to see <laughs> failure. What do you have to say about that? I have, it's so awesome you asked me this today, because today I actually have an amazing answer to this that I would not have had yesterday. Right. Because um, last night I watched this movie about the Hadron Collider. So I'm a super geek when it comes to science. Okay. I love stuff like this. Yeah. And so this this movie is called Particle Fever. And if you have Netflix, you should totally watch it. It's a documentary about how um, they were looking for the Higgs boson and they were trying to be you know, this God particle. And so mm -hmm. it was all about you know these thousands of scientists from all over the world coming together in CERN to build this enormous machine, biggest machine in all the world. And... I didn't. I, I I actually sent an email with this quote, and have a note to myself to find the name of the guy who's in the movie because he's this amazing Nobel Prize winning physicist, and I don't know his name, so I can't give accurate credit. But I will say it is the awesome physicist from Particle Fever, 
Um, so he said this thing that I had to pause the movie and, and make my husband help me remember and write down. He said, jump from failure to failure with unenthusiasm enthusiasm for it to success. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to ask you to repeat that one because at least from my point of view, it's garbage. Oh, <laughs> no, that's guy. Moment. No, jumping from failure to failure with undiminished enthusiasm is the great secret secret to success. Yeah. And I thought that is perfect. If you can, you know, the the thing is that we're all going to fail. I don't know a single entrepreneur who is a success today who hasn't failed tons of times in their past. Mm-hmm. So, and I failed lots of times. Uh, so, you know, you have to know failure is a part of life. And so don't be afraid of failure. Be afraid of not trying. Isn't that the truth? Let me ask you this, because this is something that I like to tell people. uh, Well, also, besides, I've learned a lot from it. Uh, To fail means you've learned something. If you don't fail, what have you learned? I mean, yeah, I I learned stuff from success, you know? Like, like Mm -hmm. when I went to break that Guinness World Record, I did not fail. But, um... Like, and I learned a lot in the project, don't get me wrong, like I did, um, but I learned more about who I want to be in terms of how I want to handle things that don't always go my way. I learned more about that in moments of failure, and, and I think that, that failure makes us stronger. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I don't know, I think it's both the coin, um, but I, I, I've life that a lot. Can I give you a little surprise? Okay. Uh, have you found the answer to the quote that you were asking about? No. <laughs> Success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Correct? Uh, oh. The, oh that, come. The, the, quote, the quote I read was the exact quote from the movie. So it was uh. the exact quote that the guy said. Ah. Uh, well, what I just read, I'm sorry, Skype garbled us again. Success is stumbling from failure to failure with no less, no loss of enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. That's a quote from Winston Churchill. Oh, so maybe this physicist had heard that and said it a little differently. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That I have sense. my way of quoting. <laughs> well, one of my favorite people quote all the time, or most of the time, is uh, Albert Einstein. And some of those I don't do correctly, but sometimes changing it just a little bit to fit what I was thinking is what I do. But I also admit yeah. to that that I did that. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. This guy was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, there was a lot of editing, and so he probably said Winston Churchill said that. <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> well, that's just a wonderful thing about the internet. I just, you know, there's something that I always say with people all the time: if you don't know the question, you'll never get the correct answer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> I learned to ask the correct questions. At least I try my best at it. Any, um, as in closing, actually, you've got about five minutes to do that. Um, in closing, what words of wisdom would you love to share with us? Because it has been a pleasure listening to you. Gosh, so. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure being here, um, in spite of Skype. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm you know wisdom I don't know I guess you know don't be afraid to try things and and don't let a fear be the thing that gets you in the way because you know I don't care who you aspire to be or who your role models are I guarantee you we're all scared it's just what we do with the fear that matters so you know you know everybody who's a success in life has been afraid at one point or another I'm afraid all the time but I still get out there and I make myself do the things that scare me the most. You know, like like recently cold calling was something I experimented with just as a, a new line of uh, business opened up for us. And, you know, making those phone calls was really scary for me because I don't like doing them. And I'm afraid of, you know, that people saying I'm not interested in hanging up when I'm not a telemarketer. Like I'm the, as far from a telemarketer as you can get. But I make myself do it. And, and I do it twice a week just for an hour because mm-hmm. – I want to not be scared of that anymore. And, and the more that you stretch yourself and the more that you try and the more that you, you know, make yourself do the things that make you uncomfortable, the more likely you are to be a success. So I guess that's my wisdom. And, and don't forget to, you know, stop and, 
Yeah, I could say smell the roses, but try something new. So don't be afraid to stop and try something new. <laughs> something new, relax, enjoy time with your family, your friends, whatever. Exercise, eat healthy, yeah, you know, exactly. get out in nature, get some sun. <laughs> exactly. So, yes. Um, before we go, or before we stop this with you, do uh, you have two websites? Do you want to share both or just one? Oh, it doesn't easy to find me. Um, you can find me at businessinbluejeans.com and probably the easiest way to find me. Uh-huh. Yeah, the other one is just your name, you know. Yeah, susanbarancinimo.com. You... Good luck spelling it. <laughs> 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 That's why I just give businessinbluejeans.com because, you you know, it's so much easier. <laughs> yeah. Besides, there is a dash between Barancini and Mo on the on your personal site. So, yeah. anyway... Uh, Susan, it has been wonderful he- having you here. I'm sorry, I know that you have to get going here pretty soon, but I definitely appreciate your time, and you have an open door to come back to the show any time. So just let me know when you want to come back, if you have something you want to share, etc. Just let me know. And who knows, I might give you a call somewhere down the line. I don't know. I'm not going to say when. We'll just see how it goes. Okay. So, thank you for having me on. It was a real pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, as closing, everyone, I just have to make a couple of little announcements here. Uh, RadioGuestList.com is where some of my guests from. They just wanted a little plug there, so that's them. Um, if you have questions and comments or even suggestions for the show, Please contact us through the website, uh, the contact page, or info at kwave6radio.tk. You can also listen to all our shows and links via our homepage. Uh, All listening venues are computer and smartphone friendly, so you can listen to them on whatever you want to there. And they're also downloadable, and all of them come for free. So thank you for being here, everyone. And Susan, if you're still there, thank you once again. And I guess she's hung up. So, thanks everyone for being here, and be well. See you next time. Thank you for being part of our audience. For more information about K-Wave 6 Radio and the services we offer, go to www.kwave6radio.tk. Have a wonderful day.